two, one, live. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear audience. Today we have the pleasure of having Nisar Orchard Saib, who will be uh, giving us a lecture. But before we do do that, if we start off with Tilawad by uh, Mahmoud Varizdab, who is a Marabi in the UK, if I could humbly request him to uh, recite a portion of the Quran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل نفس ذائقة الموت وإنما توفى فأون أجوركم يوم القيامة فمن زحزها عن النار وأدخل الجنة فقد فاز وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور لا تبلون في أموالكم وأنفسكم ولا تسمعون ولا تسمعون من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم ومن الذين أشركوا أذى كثيرا وإن تصبروا وتتقوا فإن ذلك من عزم الأمور جزاك الله جزاك الله محمود صاب مربي صاب uh, once again for always being uh, here available for Tilavat. Um, Jazakallah Sabah Sabah, if I could ask you to do the English translation, please. Sure. Uh, in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, every soul shall taste of death and you shall be paid in full your rewards only on the day of resurrection. So whoever is removed away from the fire and is made to enter heaven has indeed attained his goal. And the life of the world is nothing but an illusionary enjoyment. You shall surely be tried in your possessions and in your person. And you shall surely hear many hurtful things from those who were given the book before you and from those who set up equals to God. But, but if fortitude and act righteously, that indeed is a matter of strong determination. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, as jazah, sabah sab. Uh, right, today we have the pleasure of having the Moral Upbringing and Discipline Secretary for the Amdia Muslim community in the UK, Nisar Orchard Saab, who's uh, indeed a very versed uh, person in the community and uh, by Allah's grace works tirelessly uh, for the UK. Amongst his jobs is obviously looking at all the uh, burial services, one of many jobs he does, and general discipline and upbringing of uh, children, adults alike. Today he will be doing an English lecture on death and the afterlife. So without any further ado, I have the great pleasure on, of asking Nisar Orchard Saab if you could commence your lecture, please. Uh, respected viewers, uh, I'd like to wish you all a very warm assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I would also like to extend my Gratitude to the Nima Rahman and his team for once again inviting me on this well-established and prestigious platform that it has now become. So once again, Jazakallah. Um, the 
the topic, the subject matter of death and the afterlife is a fairly kind of grim sounding one. One that probably isn't really discussed too often, especially at dinner time. You know, we don't normally usually talk about death at all. From time to time we may, but we tend to be engaged in talking about sport, politics, religion, work, and so forth. But nevertheless, it is an important subject to touch on. Now, this particular subject, you know, it is a very, very vast subject. And it can be, let's say, discussed at a philosophical level, theoretical level, spiritual level. Now, I really want to probably talk about it from more or less a practical level. And... Um, and that's what I will attempt to do today. I've broken down today's presentation into three um, parts. And uh, the first basically is um, death or the hour of death. Uh, the second one is regarding the burial process. And the third one is actually offering condolences. All these things are linked to death. You see, we may not know it or we may not think about it that we actually experience death every day, whether you know it or not. Yes, we experience death every day. And because it's one of my other responsibilities within the community, I actually see death regularly as well. So I'm going to try to share some of my experiences with you. And hopefully by the end of today's session, you may have one or two questions to ask. And I will try my utmost best to answer them. So if we can start the presentation. and. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, death and the afterlife. Uh, next, please. Again, as I said, I, I've actually... Um, uh, you just start it, please, yeah, if you don't mind. Just run it. Okay, right. Uh, the very... Uh, this is broken into three parts. The first is life, death, and life, okay? Basically, there's two lives. There's the present life and there's the afterlife. And in between is the doorway to the eternal life. And that is the doorway of, you know, that we have to pass through, which is death, the burial process and condolences, okay? They are very important subject matters to discuss because it is also an education. And also I'm at the same time being educated on this subject myself uh, each passing day. Uh, next, please. So basically, life, death, life. Uh, the Talavat or that we have listened to has already set the scene, but I actually want to set the scene a bit more, okay, a bit further by sharing a few paragraphs with you that are in front of me. It is called the hour of death, okay? We cannot afford to overlook or remain indifferent to the fact that sooner or later death awaits us. There is no escape from it. Generations upon generations have passed away before us. Not a single individual was exempted, nor will anyone be exempted in the future. In the Holy Quran, chapter 3, verse 186, every soul shall taste of death. Have we given serious thought of the time of our own death? Are we prepared for it? If it, it is unfortunate that many of us give little or no consideration to this matter. We are inclined to concern ourselves more with worldly interests. The Quran teaches that the purpose of our existence is to worship God through prayer and righteous conduct and to be ever mindful of the fact that this world is a preparation for the higher life in the hereafter. In the Holy Quran, chapter 40, verse 40, O oh my people, this life of the world is but a temporary provision. And the hereafter is certainly the home of the permanent stay. And also in chapter 6, verse 33, and the life of this world is only a play and a sport, but surely the abode of the hereafter is better for those who are pious. Will you not have then sense? And just a few more short chapters here. Um, I always, I, I love sharing this next one, okay? I don't get tired of you know, sharing this with you. Here it says, let us heed the dying words of Sir Walter Scott, a famous Scottish author and historian, which he addressed to his son as he lay on his deathbed. He said, I have a minute to speak to you. 
my dear, be a good man, be virtuous, be religious, be a good man. Nothing else will give you any comfort when you come to lie here. If we lived every day as if it were the last day of our life, then we would attune ourselves to God and welcome the sweetness of death. Hazrat Marzu Ghulam Ahmed, the promised Messiah and the holy founder of the Ahmadiyya movement, peace be upon him, warned, Has, uh, always bear in mind that your death stands very near. You have no idea when that hour will come. And finally, in order to set the scene, our primary ambition, how sweet are though, so sorry, our primary ambition in this world should be to pass our life in God's favor on earth. Then would we welcome death, the doorway to heaven. So I like to think I've set the scene now. Again, death is guaranteed, okay? And uh, so right now, so I've asked you what else, what, what else in life is guaranteed, yeah? Next one, we all know that tomorrow morning the sun will rise. Next one, we know that the sun will set. And then the next one, we know of death, which I've already introduced to you, okay? Now, what you see there in front of you, okay, is a cemetery, which is the Bhishti Makra in Rabwa. And here is, let's say, a plain headstone. When we leave this world, we want to be remembered for something, okay? And when we see headstones, we tend to see these uh, words that you see in front of you, inna lillahi wa inna alayhi rajoon. Also, you know, people, you know, put many other things on. And this is also another common uh, um, verse from the Holy Quran. So enter though amongst my chosen servants and enter though my garden. Some people put other things on as well. But what are you deserving on these words, for these words that's going to reflect your life in this world? Okay, so keep that in mind. This particular headstone will be your last address in this world before you pass on to the next world. Also, this particular the next uh, ayat, you know, remember that this life we have, we have to embrace it because we have only one chance. And in this chapter 23, until when death comes to one of them, he says entreating, my Lord, send me back that I may be, that I may do righteous deeds in the life that I have left behind. He is pleading, please send me back, send me back. No, no chance. You have one life and this is the life you have to do righteous deeds, okay? So do not make light of this life you have. You do not have much time in this life, which I will show you in the next few screens just coming up, okay? We do not have much time. And in a way, the next few screens that you will see, I am trying to, let's say, deliberately trying to scare you in a way, in order to try to wake you up do not waste your time in this precious one life that you have. Now, again, as I said, we all experience death, okay? Why? Because whenever we go to sleep, Allah, he will take our soul away from us when we are sleeping. And, and we hope that he will return our soul to us to wake up. If Allah does not return our soul, then we say, inna lillahi wa inna lai rajun. We have passed on. But inshallah, Allah will return your soul tomorrow, okay? And you will wake up. You will stretch out your arms, okay? But please remember, when Allah returns your soul tomorrow for you to wake up, please think of it this way, that he has given you another chance, another chance in order to uh, conduct righteous deeds so that you can taste the sweetness of death and you can pass on to the permanent afterlife. Praises to Allah who gives us life after he has caused us to die and to him is his return, okay? So please, when you wake up every morning, Allah has blessed you by returning your soul. 
because we are in a state of death whenever we sleep. We all experience death on a daily basis. And when he gives you that, when your soul back, he has given you another chance to increase your levels of righteousness so you can enter the gardens of paradise. Now, let's try and calculate how much time that we do have left in this life, okay? I'll try my best, okay, right? How much time do we have left to acquire moral values in order to meet our objectives, okay? Now, if you could just very, very slowly in the deem sub, just one click at a time, okay, right? Now, now, the life expectancy for someone in the UK is 82 years old. That's a fair, it's a, it's a fair innings, okay? Ladies in the UK, they tend to live a few years longer, okay? But 82 years is a good innings, right? Now, let's try to convert this now to see how much time we really do have. If you convert years into months, 82 years is equal to 984 months. So I should repeat that. I should say only 984 months. It doesn't sound a long time, does it? 984 months. Today is the 27th of July. We're coming to the end of another month now. Months just go past just like that. And we only have 984 months to live. That's if you were to live till 82 years. Sometimes, sadly, people pass away even before that. Okay. Next one. What does months equal to in, in weeks? Achha? It equals to nearly 4,264 weeks. Only 4,264 weeks if you were to live to 82 years. And in terms of days, it translates to just under 30,000 days. Days. Here we're coming to the end of another day. Out of those 30,000 days that we hope to live up to 82 years, another one has gone. Days go much, much faster than weeks and months. We only have just under 30,000 days to live. And to convert that into hours, it's only 718,000 hours. Already another 24 hours have gone past today, nearly. You know, so please, our time is not much in this earth. That's why do not fully focus on worldly interests. You focus on raising your levels of taqwa and righteousness. Now, let's see how do we spend 24 hours, okay? I've kind of generally just from the top of my head, I've, I've guessed that if we go through one at a time, the Sahib, we let's say I've given you eight hours of sleep every day. Is that enough for you? Eight hours? Good. Okay. Next one, you have to go to work, let's say eight hours. Then the next one, you have to, let's say, eat, you know, let's say one hour for eating, your breakfast, lunch, and so forth. And then you have to travel maybe from here to there. Prayers. I've only given one hour for prayers. I a secretary to be it, I should have given more hours for prayers, okay? And then family time again. You know, I haven't given much time for family time. But out of that, all those things that we tend to do on a normal daily basis, we have three hours left. Three hours left in the day to do all those other things that we want to do, you know, especially in order to carry out righteous deeds. And you have to ask yourself these questions. Do you give enough time to yourself on a daily basis in order to raise your levels of righteousness? Because you don't have much time. Look, I've just calculated, okay, you know, how much time we really, really do have. So 82 years is equal to 900 and so on. So anyway, in the time that we have, men have used their hidden powers and climbed to the pinnacles of their professions. Their achievements have won them worldwide acclamation and their names have been embossed in the records of history. Now, those four gentlemen you see in front of you, they really, really are superior and excelled in their field. Um, Albert Einstein, Roger Federer, and the greatest he claims himself to be, Muhammad Ali and Professor Abdus Salam. They truly have reached the pinnacle of their professions. But the greatest are those whose works are acclaimed by God, and happiest are those who live for him and taste the spiritual nectar of the paradise both here 
and in the hereafter, in the next life. Those are the people. The example I've come up with is seen in these pictures here. Khalif al Salih, Ramullah, you know, he was a well educated person. He studied in Oxford. He was a sportsman. He, he, he rode horses and he was also a spiritual leader. He was our Khalifa. But actually, I want to focus on the gentleman next to him, okay? Sachaudi uh, Muhammad Zafrullah Khan, Raziyalanho. I want to focus on him. Look how simple, look how humble he is in a dressing gown. You know, that's how we should be showing humble and simplicity in our, in our daily um, um, ways in life. But the thing is, not only did he show simplicity and humbleness, you know, he actually achieved many things in his professional and academic life. He was the first foreign minister of Pakistan. Um, he was the chief judge in the, in, 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 in the court in The Hague. He, he was, um, I believe, the president of the United Nations for a while and so forth. He certainly did reach the pinnacle of his profession. But looking at these pictures, his simplicity and his humbleness, these are the things that we should um, strive for and yearn on a daily basis. With those only those three hours left in our day that I've already calculated that we have left to acquire and to attain higher levels of taqwa. Well, so basically, when we are going to taste that sweetness of death, okay, we are knocking at the door. When we pass through that door, we all know the first question that's going to be asked. And it's about your prayers, about your prayers. Again, I am asking you all a rhetorical question. What is the quality of your prayer like? When you knock at that door and pass through, and Allah will say, okay, come this way. Let me go through the book. Let, let me catch your name, right? Let's see the status of your namaz, yeah? You know, are we prepared right now? As I said, the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, he says, we do not know when our hour of death is going to come. Are we prepared even now to answer to Allah, yes, my prayers is up to date. I said my five daily prayers a day. I did not join my prayers when I didn't when I didn't have to, okay? Are we prepared for that? That is the chance that this life has given us. So we have to embrace this life as well as we have to embrace death as well. Now, when we do something, when we strive for something, we hope to be rewarded as well. And when we pass through that door and get asked that first question, we hope to enter the gardens of paradise. In chapter 47, the rewards for the righteous are explained very, very clearly, okay? A description of the garden promised to the righteous. And it follows on and it says, therein are rivers of water which corrupt not, and rivers of milk of which the taste changes not and rivers of wine, a delight to those who drink, and rivers of clarified honey, and in it will they have all kinds of fruits, and lastly, and especially, and forgiveness from their Lord. That is what is awaiting us on the other side of that door of death, gardens of the righteousness, your reward for, be, for carrying out righteous deeds, in this particular life, okay? So please keep in mind, our life is very, very short. We do not know when Allah will, will keep our soul from us. And this is why in order to taste that paradise that awaits us, this life is giving us that chance to arrive in those gardens of righteousness, okay? So again, as I said, I've just barely scratched the surface of, base, of the so-called philosophical aspect of the purpose of life. We have to embrace life in order to get to our objectives on the other side of the door of death. The second point is actually the actual burial process because, you know, people don't really think about death at all. But when all of a sudden it comes on you, you say, oh, what do I do now? When I say when it comes on, top on you, if let's say a dear member of your family passes away, People are left in a sort of trance. Ah, oh, what do we do now? Well, this is what I want to explain to you, okay? 
the next fight. Now, life in general is expensive, okay? The, 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 I'm sure we all agree to that. Death is also expensive as well. So because death is also expensive, maybe I should say live as long as possible, okay? Because I'm going to share a few figures with you here, okay? First of all, um, funeral plans. People ask about funeral plans, okay? Now, yes, you can take funeral plans out. There's, there's no harm in it at all. Um, you can pay the small subscription every month towards a funeral plan. You can look into it, and that will prepare you. Because you do not want to burden maybe your family come the time with thousands and thousands to pay. So it's a good idea to look into a funeral plan. Also, if, for example, let's say you are below, within your means, depends on your means and your benefits that you receive, if you cannot afford to pay for the funeral costs of yourself or anyone, then you can, then your next of kin, uh, they can later on find out from the Department of Work and Pensions whether you qualify from the bereavement fund to pay for the cost of the funeral as well. Now, if you don't have a funeral plan and if you don't qualify for in the DWP, well, you should have set aside five to seven thousand pounds because that's what it costs to bury someone these days, okay? Every cemetery has different prices and different um, tiers. But um, but please, these are some figures that you have to keep in mind. There's the, there's the cost for the funeral director and there's also the cost for the actual cemetery, the actual plot itself. Okay. Now, once someone passes away, what you need, the most important thing is the paperwork. And um, um, the hospital or the paramedics, they may supply you with a medical certificate. And, uh, and from the medical certificate, you'll go to the council, to the registrar, and then they will provide you a death certificate. But the most important form to carry out the actual burial, you will get from the, de the, the birth and death registrar, and that is called the burial order form, or in simpler informal terms, it's called the green form. Why? Because it's green. <laughs> okay? So it's the green form that you need in order to... Uh, get permission to collect the body from the hospital, let's say, and then bring it back in order to go through the next set of um, tasks. Obviously, we've collected the body from the hospital, and then we prepare for the wash and the ghusl. There's many, many questions that can come out of this, okay? But again, I'm just leaving it at a, at a, at a high level for now. But uh, regarding uh, the wash and the ghusl, um, of course, men wash men and ladies wash ladies. Alhamdulillah, within our Jamaat, you know, we do have um, HFS funeral services, which is run by Emily Mukhalid Hayat and Emily, um, who has provided these services. And, um, and we all work together. We liaise with his business and with the Jamaat. And he has first class facilities and, uh, and everything is accommodated and catered for for everyone. The Janaza prayer, normally, you know, we would love our beloved Hazur to lead Janaza prayer, but unfortunately, in the last one and a half years or so, Janaza prayers have been restricted at the cemetery before the actual burial takes place because of the current climate. And um, uh, and these days, things are opening up, things are relaxing now, and more people are allowed to come to the cemetery in order to offer the Janaza prayer and be part of the burial procession and uh yeah so so these these are basically the actual tasks that have to be carried out i can go into them much much more deeper but maybe you want to, maybe i'll save it maybe you want to ask some questions at the end regarding these particular steps of how to carry out a burial because there are other aspects as well i've given you the basic scenario where someone has passed away at home uh, sorry in the hospital but sometimes people can pass away at home. Sometimes people want their bodies repatriated, maybe taken back to Pakistan, or actually brought from another country to the UK. Uh, so there's, there's many, many different aspects as well. And obviously sometimes the coroner may get involved just in case the death was unexpected 
and it needs a proper further test, further checks and post-mortems and so forth. The coroner may be involved and so, and that, mean, that, makes, uh, that means we need extra paperwork as well. So again, uh, there is maybe a bit more to explain, but I've given you the general um, aspects of how to uh, carry out a particular burial. And uh, now, when someone passes away, it is, it is uh, a sad time. And we do want to offer our condolences to people. And if we just take away the pandemic right now, what we would normally do, we would normally go to someone's home to give them our sympathies and condolences. And th what I'm going to share with you now, this was something that was prepared by myself and Imam Saab. And we forwarded it to our beloved Hazur, and Hazur approved of the following um, aspects of how we should conduct condolences. Now, here, during the time for condolences, there are practices exercised by some members that are not in alignment with the teachings of Islam, okay? For example, certain undesirable acts. There is no evidence that the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, his family or any other companions ever gathered people at the house of the deceased for a certain number of days to offer prayers for the deceased, or recite the Holy Quran, or perform tasbih, or enjoy a feast in the name of the deceased. All these things must not take place. Okay? You may think that's possibly cruel, but we have to avoid any kind of innovations or bidits coming into the pristine uh, faith of Islam. Again, none of these was practiced during the time of our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. So the, the recommendation is that when you go for um, condolence, condolers should come for a short while, offer their sympathies and comfort the family members of the deceased they should then leave allowing the other condolers to come. Sometimes what you may see, people in the right spirit, they do come, but they may tend to hang around for a, for a while. Rather than just the 10 minutes, 10 minutes becomes an hour. After giving the initial sympathies, then they start talking about this, they start talking about that, you know. You come for a purpose, and you have to remember other people are also coming. It's in the confines, more or less, in someone's home. So you have to think about the space and so forth. Again, as I said, this particular um, session today is about a practical way of doing these condolences. Now, grief and sorrow. It is, very, it is a very delicate and emotional time, but one should try and exercise calm and patience rather than crying out loudly over the dead and tearing one's clothes and tormenting oneself. Now, sometimes people do go hysterical, okay? <coughs> and we have to show a level of calmness and restraint and patience. The, the example I will give is that when our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, when he was passing a graveyard, he saw a grief-stricken woman um, sitting next to the grave of her son, I believe, okay? And she was crying. She was overwhelmed in, with grief. And our beloved Prophet reminded her of her duties to Allah. And she replied to him, what do you know? Have you ever lost a son? And of course, our beloved Prophet has lost a few, had lost a few sons in his lifetime. And, but the first and foremost thing that he was on, on his mind was to remember the rights of Allah, not to get hysterical. And we have to practice that as well. We have to show patience and calmness during these difficult times as well. And that was a good example that I just showed you of how you should control yourself in such an emotional time. Also, the next one, seeing the face of the deceased or man. Now, you see, maybe you have experienced this, but I remember, let's say, in the Fuzzle Mosque, when the body or the coffin, the janaza, is taken into, let's say, the Mahmood Hall, where the ladies tend to be. Now, of course, 
men are not allowed to see the face of a lady who has passed away, then why should it be the other way around? When a man is taken into, let's say, the Mahmood Hall and ladies are there, the same applies. Ladies should not be seeing the face of a man either. It all comes down to parda. Parda in life also applies to parda in death as well. Hazrat Khalif al-Masih Khamis, may Allah be his helper, said, Merim, a person with whom marriage is not allowed, can see the face, okay? So basically, um, if, let's say, someone's sister passed away, then that person can, the brother can see the face of his sister, okay? That is Merim, okay? Or if it goes on further, or someone who is very close to the deceased and regarding whom the close relatives, such as the husband, wife, brother, father or mother, have no objection in showing them the face of the deceased. So please keep that in mind. Because here, Azur, in his writings, dated the 22nd of March, 2017, Barda in life also applies to Barda in death. Again, not many people know that. That's why it is, at the end of the day, an education. And I'm also learning day by day in this particular. Food. Food. Now, of course, we should cater and accommodate for the bereaved family. Again, in these notes in which our beloved Hazur approved, he said, unless in exceptional circumstances, mourners should not be offered food, and especially they should not expect food on the occasion of condolence. Always keep in mind that they come to sympathize and not to eat. I told you earlier, when you come for to give sympathies, it should basically be 10 minutes or so, okay? Sympathize with them, give comfort, and then leave. You should not wait for tea. If you're offered tea, you should politely refuse, okay? You should not hang around. The food is for the immediate family only, those people who are affected. If you have a mother or father living with you and he or she has passed away, those the guardians of the parents who have passed away, they are the immediate family. Maybe the immediate family has brothers and sisters who live nearby. They themselves should prepare some food and bring it to those people who have been directly affected. So sources of food such are family, relatives, friends, and neighboring members of the Jamaat, families living in the same Jamaat, and also the Jamaat as well, the Marcus, the center, they're also ready to supply food for three days, you know, with, without any hesitation. But we want to give an opportunity, a chance for other people to provide food as well. So, so these things are very, very relevant and I will tell you now, I mean, I'll be very, very open with you, that sometimes when people order food, they order food, they, they, they order food for 60, 70 people. I said, why so many people? Is it not a party? You know, is it not for people who live nearby? These are for people who have been affected directly at home. So again, you know, sometimes it is, let's say, a struggle to try to make them understand. And it is a struggle from a point of view it is a very delicate and emotional time, and, I, and we do have to tread very carefully how we present our words to them. And uh, so basically, money and time covering the costs and preparations of the food should not be concerned as the spirit of the members should come to the foremost. The spirit of the members, and that is not in doubt, you know. Every time our Jamaat members come to the fore, always wanting to help in any aspect, especially in this last page, other requirements, things like gazebos and chairs tend to be required at this time. Again, help is sought locally. They will go to Betel Fatu, Betel Hassan. They will bring chairs and gazebos and tables, bring it to the house to look after the family. The spirit of the Jamaat is not questionable when it comes to, 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 to this aspect of our duty to our Jamaat members who have lost a loved one at the time. Now, these are the three aspects I wanted to share with you today. There is much, much more. I, I like to think there will be a few questions ready for me. And um, so please keep these things in mind. I do feel very 
um, privilege, you know, to be honored, to be given this duty to look after the janazas at the time. I tell you now, you know, I will do this job as long as I'm allowed to do it, okay? Because there is no more honorable job when you come to look after the family of a Bareev. You come to them before the passing away, you guide them, and then after passing away, you still hold their hand and you counsel them. I hope, you know, my presentation today has maybe enlightened you with a few aspects that you may not have known before. And um, there is a lot more to this subject, and maybe a few months down the line, I'll be invited to present you a part two on this particular subject. So once again, Jazakallah to Nadeem Saab and to his team for inviting me. Thank you very much. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Nisar Saba, as per usual, great lecture. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of people are saying Jazakallah and have found it really inspiring mm -hmm. and informative. I'll now pass on to Saba Saab, who will ask the few questions that have come through, giving you an opportunity to answer them. Saba Saab. Dear Assalamu alaikum. We have a few questions there. Uh, the first question is, could you please shed light on the spiritual rank and how it affects one's place in the different levels of heaven? Oh, um, well, again, you know, already you will be, it depends on how you live your life in this life, okay? We already know them, I can't, I can't remember the name of the verse, but there is a uh, there is a verse which talks about different categories of people, the Nabayin, the prophets, the, the righteous, the rightly guided, and so forth. So there are recognized categories of people, and from those four categories, we know that the Nabayin is the highest, okay? And because those ranks are in this life, that will also be reflected also in the next life as well, okay? And that's why this life that we are given, that one chance, that one chance, we have to embrace it to make sure that, that, that our levels are higher and higher. And that example of Sir Muhammad Jordi Zafrullah Khan, Razi Alanho, to me, answers it completely. A man of great achievement, academically and professionally, but to me, his real achievement was his simplicity and his um, humbleness, which will really uh, make his rank very, very high. Uh, the next question we have is from Basharat Ahmasa from Liverpool. Uh, the question is, after death and burial, where we should imagine our dearest, in grave or in heaven? How much time we should feel that after burial? Now, where is uh, superior? I think they're asking, you know, you know, we as human beings, you know, our mind is so limited. You know, we have a capacity that we do not know everything. That is why we are told to believe in the unseen. That is why it is integral in our faith, in our belief that we have to believe in the hereafter, in the next life. I'm not saying it is blind faith, okay? But that is an integral part of our faith. We have to believe in the unseen. That's why I'm probably saying, I don't really know, yeah? But we have to believe that, yes, there is, as I described to you from the Holy Quran, there is gardens of righteousness where milk is flowing, honey is flowing. You probably can't fathom that right now, but we have to believe that because it's an integral part. Where is um, the body is just basically um, a, a carrier for the soul. It is decaying in the ground. The soul has gone on to different levels, okay? And I can't quite answer that because, as I said, we should believe and that, uh, uh, in the unseen and we should believe in the hereafter. Uh, our minds are limited. I showed you those four categories of people. I showed you Albert Einstein, Roger Federer, Muhammad Ali, and uh, Professor Abdus Salam. They are very, very clever people. Everyone has different capacities, okay, to understand things. And, and I'm being very, very honest, I do not fully understand, but alhamdulillah, I have that belief in the unseen and in the hereafter. 
Jazakallah Nisa sir. Uh, the last question we have is from Umar sir. And he's asking, uh, the question is regarding the punishment of the grave. What is the reality of it and what is fiction? As there are a lot of false theories or horror stories regarding that. The punishment of the grave? Yes, the punishment of grave. What's the reality and what's the fiction? In terms of after we move on, are we going to be punished? Well, uh, yes, I think what uh, he's trying to ask there are some stories about the punishment of graves, like snakes and all those bits and pieces. How much of that is reality and how much of that is fiction? So did you did you mention snakes? Uh, yeah, it was not asked explicitly, but uh, that's what I understood from so that. I'm going to quickly answer that question regarding punishment. You know, we do go through a filter, okay? From this life, we will go through a filter. There is a level of punishment, but out of that filter, we will all enter those gardens of righteousness, okay? We will all we'll be punished to the levels corresponding to how we live this life, okay? And we will we'll go, we'll go through the filter, and inshallah, we will all reach those gardens of righteousness, paradise, as we, as we describe it. Uh, Jazakallah, Nisar Sahib, I have no more questions. Jazakallah, Sabah Sahib, and Nisar Sahib. As per usual, um, Nisar Sahib, truly inspirational, and in the time allocated, Jazakallah, for answering the questions. Uh, I would like members to bear in mind for the next few weeks now uh, that the Leem lectures will be paused due to Jalsa, and inshallah we will return within three weeks back with our lectures Monday and Tuesday, Urdu on Monday and English on Tuesday. So for the next three weeks, we will not be having any lectures during Jalsa time. Um, I would like to end by humbly requesting Nisar Saab if he can uh, lead us in silent prayer so we can conclude the session and then inshallah we shall see all our membership back inshallah within three weeks. Nisar Saab, could you lead us in silent prayer? Please join me in silent prayer. Amen. Once again, the Sal Sab, Sabah Sab, Jazakallah, and to all the viewers, Allah bless you, and we shall see you, inshallah, within three weeks. Assalamu alaikum.